right, why don't you go ahead and stand up, and we're going to sing about Our Redeemer Lives Today. today.
last one from a couple weeks ago. And uh, we're just going to go over a little bit. There's parts here for the guys and for the women. And so um, we're going to go over those again, teach it to you. It's real easy, but um, just the words are hallelujah. So I think I can handle that. Um, we'll start with the ladies first. Just sing this next part with me. each Sunday and we can sing to you and we can have a great time singing to you too and I pray Lord that you are honored by our worship through song today. Amen. This song will prepare you for the message so make this your prayer to him. Get ready. Jewel, Lord, 
For the men in the group, I would like to state that Valentine's Day is coming. And, uh, today is the 3rd of February. You have, you know, that long to get ready. I can't do the math. Thank you. <laughs> there is a math teacher here, I forgot. All right. So, fellas, whatever it takes, get it going, all right? And you'll be a happy man when it's over with, we hope. All right, and so today in 2 Corinthians, the seventh chapter, we're going to be talking about matters of the heart, thank you, we're going to be talking about asking for heart space, because that's what Paul does in the one verse that we're going to look at today. You know, sometimes I get, uh, I get to looking through the scriptures, and as you, as you look at the texts and the, uh, and the uh, topics, it's just almost hard to go more than one verse at a time, although I'm hoping and praying that you're reading way farther ahead of that and you're keeping it all in context because that's what it's all about, taking the message each week, studying what comes before, what comes after, keeping it in its place. That's where you get the real understanding of these things. The, the verse that we're going to look at begins the conclusion of Paul's very personal plea to the Corinthians to accept his ministry. He has been uh, attacked and put down by what he will term later false apostles. They have uh, brought questions forward pertaining to his uh, methods, pertaining to what he is telling them. And so in this passage of scripture and getting ready to conclude at, this, at the end of the seventh chapter, he is essentially defending himself. Now, he's not doing that in a defensive way. In fact, what Paul's wanting to do is reestablish or draw them back into relationship with him. Relationship is important. Everything we do in the body 
has to do with relationship. Our relationship to the Lord who saves us and empowers us, gives us a reason to do this, and our relationships with one another. The body is the body. And you want your body to all work and all work in synchronization and work when the head tells it to. That's important. And so relationship is important. How does this relate to us today? It relates to us simply in this matter. We ask each other for heart space sometimes. We want to be accepted. We want to not just be part of the body, but feel that we are part of the body. Feel that what we are doing is important and that it's part of the Lord's work and that it builds the whole into, into an edifice, not a building, but an edifice of the Spirit that glorifies God. That's important to us. And so it's important as we work together to make sure we're being effective in communicating to one another how much we love each other, how much we need each other, and what great partners we are in ministry. Now, that doesn't mean we all have to do the same thing. In fact, if we're functioning properly, we're not all doing the same stuff. God arranges the parts in the body as He sees fit, and the gifts, that talents, and abilities that you bring, He brings for a reason because it plugs a hole, opens up a new window of ministry, helps the body to move forward to honor and glorify God and build the kingdom. That's what it's about. And so in the seventh chapter, the second verse, after he's talked about uh, purging yourself from uh, defilement of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness and the fear of God, he says to them, make room for us in your hearts. Make room for us in your hearts. We wronged no one. We corrupted no one. We took advantage of no one. And I think you're beginning to see the three points to the sermon, okay? We wronged no one. We corrupted no one. We took advantage of no one. Paul pleads with the Corinthians, and literally the term uh, make room for us means to enlarge your heart. Enlarge the space that is there for us. Maybe you've had an experience like that and you can relate to the way he felt. Maybe you, maybe you had a conflict with someone and you wanted nothing more than to get back into their heart, so to speak, when that was over with. You wanted that child, you wanted that, the parent, you wanted uh, the brother, the sister, the friend, whoever. After the misunderstanding and after the shrapnel stopped zinging around and the smoke cleared, you wanted nothing more than a restored relationship with them. Well, that's the way Paul feels toward the Corinthian church. There's been trouble. We've, we've charted in the chapters coming up to this the conflicts, and certainly in 1 Corinthians, the problems that Paul had to address because it was his ministry to do so. He wasn't shirking his responsibility. He was harsh with them when he needed to be. 1 Corinthians 5 has a tremendous passage where he literally tells them what they need to do, and it's not an easy task to, to take and to do. But he tells them, and the rest of the book is the same way. But against that backdrop, he doesn't want them to lose the heart space for one another. Make room for me. Enlarge the space in your heart for us. Samuel did an, an interestingly similar thing in 1 Samuel, the 12th chapter, the third verse. As he was getting ready to depart from his ministry, that, the Old Testament prophet who had done so much in uh, bringing Israel to where uh, it should be and, and soon there'll be a, a king anointed and all this stuff is happening. As Samuel sort of begins to wind down to his ministry, he stands before the people and he says, here I am, okay, here I am. Bear witness against me before the Lord and his anointed. If that's what you need to do, you know, bear witness against me before God himself. Whose ox have I taken? Whose donkey have I taken? Whom have I defrauded? Whom have I oppressed? Or from whose hands have I taken a bribe to blind my eyes with it? I will restore it to you. And the people responded, well, you haven't done any of this stuff. See, asking the rhetorical question makes people think. Makes people think. And rather than posing it in questions, Paul makes statements that are designed to remind the Corinthians of the relationship they have had. And remember, this is not 2,000-year-old history. This may apply to us today. Maybe we need to look around us at the people sitting near us with a greater degree of appreciation. Perhaps we need to seek somebody who is working hard in their ministry. Pat them on the back and say, thank you for what you do. Uh, we appreciate it. Maybe, ah, I'm about to say this to get in trouble, husbands and wives <laughs> need to hug each other a little bit and say, you know what, I appreciate what you do for me every day on a day-to-day -day basis. I can tell you right now I'd be hungry and naked if it wasn't. That's not something you'd want to see. Okay? So, we need to appreciate. 
one another. Brothers and sisters in the Lord, a family, a unit. And I think at Cornerstone we do. I think we appreciate the cross ministry that we enjoy, people doing different things. It gives variety, it gives spice, it gives a lot of fun, uh, and, it, and it blesses the Lord and moves the kingdom forward. That's important. We must not lose that. But like Paul, we need to make sure that as we work with people, we work with them in such a way that what we do communicates our appreciation to them and then is effective. There is great insight, great insight into success in working with people in the one verse we're looking at today. And so let's do that. Let's dive in. Look at these three areas. All right. He says, make room for us. Enlarge your heart. Make space for us. First of all, we wronged no one. All right. We wronged no one. And that comes up for us as point number two. Points two, three, and four are going to be the three things Paul writes about here. As we study, as we talk today, think about your relationships with others. Not just in the body. Think about the the folks you encounter in the world who need Jesus. If you deal with them on these three bases, you're going to be showing them something more than human care. You're going to be showing them that the Lord cares as well. And so the first one is, Paul writes, we wronged no one. And the word wronged means to commit an injustice against someone, harming, hurting, or mistreating them. But the basic idea of the Greek word gets back to that judicial concept of committing injustice against no one. We wrong no one. And so point number two, which is suggestion or command number one, okay, is in your dealings with people, in ministry, in business, wherever, be a believer, show you're a believer, deal with them justly. Does anyone like to be treated unjustly? No. In fact, if you look behind many of the resentments, many of the deeply rooted conflicts, even many of the crimes that are committed, are committed by people who feel like they've been treated unjustly, maybe by the law, maybe by uh, a preacher, maybe by an authority figure, maybe by a teacher, maybe by parents. People, when they feel wronged, tend to take actions that are, that are thoughtless, that could be categorized as stupid, things they would not do normally. But because they feel like it's the only way, the only way they can get recognition and maybe get a little back from what they've lost, that's what they do. And so we must make sure we do not wrong anyone. We do not treat people unjustly. Now, what, what does that entail? Well, there's a passage of Scripture, or one verse, rather, in Acts, the 10th chapter. Uh, there's the definition, by the way. You've got that in your outline. Acts 10 and verse 38, where Peter was talking about Jesus. And here's what he said, sort of summing up the ministry of Jesus Christ. He said, you know Jesus of Nazareth. How God anointed him with the Holy Spirit with power and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him. Now the word I want to focus in on is that term, he went about doing good or that, that phrase, that bit. He went about doing good. The term doing good there means literally he was of benefit to those he met. Okay, those who, who, who Jesus entered their life he was a benefit to them. Now stop a minute and think about what Jesus did during his time on earth. The good stuff and the stuff that we, that we think is goody, goody type stuff, that's easy to say. Well, he fed people. You know, oh, that's good. He was certainly a benefit to them. He helped people. He healed the sick. All this stuff. Those were, those were good things. But Jesus also taught some very harsh things. Okay? When he stood before the scribes and Pharisees, and he said to them, you know, you fellows are like whitewashed tombs, clean on the outside, full of dead men's bones on the inside. He was benefiting them. It never is a benefit to try to hide or gloss over when somebody needs something changed in their heart. And so Christ was not failing to benefit them. He was benefiting them. When he told the Pharisees, you know, you guys are, are uh, amazing. You travel far on land and sea to make one proselyte or one disciple. And when you do, you make him twice as much a son of hell as you are. Now, was he being unkind there just to be unkind? Was he trying to get a rise out of somebody? Was he just gigging somebody like we do sometimes? No. That was a benefit to them to hear that. When he overturned the money changers' tables in the temple and drove them out with a whip, that was not to destroy, that was not to demean, that was not to tear down. It was to benefit them. And so we need to understand that dealing justly, and you can see this reflected in the law, even the law of the land. 
The law of the land should reward those who do well and punish those who do evil. It's a benefit to both sides. When we deal justly with people, we don't hold back the truth. Now, we do it in love, as Ephesians says. We speak the truth in love or live the truth in love. But we deal justly because in the long run, that's what benefits people and that's what draws them closer to the Lord. No one wants to have to do with a God that is unfair, unjust, and doesn't care. And our God is neither unfair or unjust, and He does care. But the only reflections of that people will ever see is sitting right here and standing up here. They're going to see us, and they're going to judge our Savior by how we live and how we treat them. So the first thing we must do, we must deal justly with, with people. Wrong no one. Don't commit injustices on either side, either way. Don't fail to be the person of the Word and the person of the Spirit you should be, but also don't hurt people, don't wrong people, don't, don't step outside of justice in your dealings with them. It will speak to them, and it will show them the Savior in a positive light. They'll want to know who He is and more about Him. Number three, which is command number two, all right? Be a people builder. Build people. Paul says we wrong no one. Secondly, we corrupted no one. We corrupted no one. And the term corrupted means literally to bring into a worse state. All right? Bringing people who want, uh, bringing people to want, rather, or to lack in their life through dishonorable dealing. This can be done by flattering or by false teaching. Either way, that it can happen. It can happen by literally stealing from people. But basically, this is something that's done by communicating false things to people. So, we don't corrupt, and Paul says we corrupted no one, but rather we want to take the opposite way of that. We want to be builders of people, build lives, build one another, especially in the Lord, but also build those who don't know the Lord up that they might come to know Him, see Him in us, and want to know why we are the way we are. Now, there's a lot of Scripture on this, so I'm going to quickly blast through a bunch of verses, all right, with very little comment and let the word speak for itself. The writer of the Hebrews says, Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God, but go the polar opposite direction, encourage one another. That is, comfort, stimulate, push a little bit one another, so that as uh, encourage one so that as long as it is still called today so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness or the fakery of sin. Being an encourager means that you are pushing people toward the positive things and growth in Christ rather than discouraging them and helping them to turn away from the better way and the better path. Romans 14, 19. So then we pursue as believers the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. Literally, the creation of an edifice. It's a, it's a building term. We are literally building up one another as we relate to each other in the right way. 1 Corinthians 12, 7. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit so that they can be selfish and go off on their own and absolutely have no impact in anyone's life. Oh, I didn't read that right. I'm sorry. Manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. The common good. Within the body, we're given gifts, talents, and abilities that we might minister, that we might serve, that we might have impact in people's lives. Ephesians 4, 29. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification. Again, that idea of building up. According to the need of the moment, okay, that means appropriate, in its place, be prepared, be ready, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Do you know how important grace is? We talk about grace a lot. Grace is... The unmerited favor of God. Grace is the thing that gives us the great sigh. When life is overwhelming and we know we've messed up and things are all wrong, the grace of God imp implodes into us. And Paul talks about we don't, we don't even sin, not because we're under law, but because we are under grace. Grace is the big, oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, I don't have to earn this. Thank you, Lord, I don't have to try to be good enough to get to heaven. Thank you, Lord, you've given me so much. That's grace. It's as much a recognition as it is something happening. It's a recognition that God loves you, that God cares about you, that He is inclusive, that He brings you in, wants to use you in His service. And when we realize that, what a tremendous relief it is. And guess what Paul says here? By what we say to people, we can be channels of grace 
to them. Channels of grace. We give grace to those who hear. That is a wonderful concept, a tremendous idea, and we are blessed as they are. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 11. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you also are doing. When we make up our minds to be people builders... And we do that in every way. To those who do not know the Lord, we want to we build and progress with the relationship, build rapport, so that the door can come open. They'll see how much we care, and then they'll want to know about the Lord who's put us in that position. When we're in the body, we edify and build up one another so that in happiness and joy, the body remains a good place to be and a good place to base ministry from and, a, and good associates to go out and change the world for Jesus Christ relational stuff. Make room in your hearts. We want to be people builders. And then finally, the fourth thing he says in the seventh verse, we took advantage of no one. We took advantage of no one. And this we see as trusting God. We want to be God trusters. You don't take advantage of people because you think you have enough and your heart's at peace. You take advantage of people when you don't think you're going to get what you need and you think you have to get it by force and by your own way. This term means to seek to get more. It could be money. I want more money. I want more for myself. It could be a cult of personality. I just want to be the, the, the king on the, on the mountain. I just want everything to come to me. I want everybody to, to worship me and know about me and it's all about me. It could be material things. It could be allegiance based on falsehood. We tell lies just to get people to come to us and get people to, to buy into whatever we happen to be selling. I've, stopped, I've tried to stop using the term, it's like a used car salesman, because I know some used car salesmen I like. Okay, but, but if you were to think way back, okay, maybe, it's like, I'll say anything, what's it going to take to get you to drive this baby off the lot today? You know, that's what it is, taking advantage of people. The opposite, the polar opposite of that is when we understand that our needs are met, our ministries are empowered, we are given victory, and man, we can celebrate and enjoy and have a great time simply by trusting Almighty God. I want to talk about something that's been going on at Cornerstone. It's been going on right in front of your faces for several weeks now. That is the effort to get this uh, little uh, Mary Lee King over here from China. It's going to work out, I'm telling you, at this point, we have north of $7,000. Yesterday, we took in $1,000 on that pitiful little, should we call it a yard sale? It was actually an asphalt sale out there, all right? Now, I'm going to tell you something else has happened besides raising money for that. Now, money is great, and, and we needed to do this, but I've seen people working together. I've seen smiles. I've heard laughter. I stood out there and chewed the fat with several folks yesterday. We cut up. We laughed. We told stories. We had a great time. When you base your ministry around God and what he can do, it makes you have a blast. And I feel sorry for people who, uh, who have, have never learned in their Christian life the joy of networking with other believers who are excited about getting out there and doing stuff for the Lord. Paul could say, we took no advantage of you to the Corinthians. And he's going to expand on that a little bit later, I'll warn you. In his rant... We got a rant coming up in a few chapters. I can't wait for that. Okay? In his rant, he's going to expand on that. But I'll tell you what, when you are looking at others within the body as competition, well, I don't want them to get more than I get of recognition, budget money, whatever. When you look upon others as competitors, when you look upon others as, uh, as dangers to your little kingdom and your little part of the empire, you know, that's when bad feelings, upset stomachs, headaches, pitiful attitudes arise when we trust God and we say you know what God is going to supply everything we need in fact Philippians 1 6 I'm confident of this very thing he who began a good work in you that can be in here or it can be in here a good work in you will perfect it or bring it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus Ephesians 3 20 and 21 now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think I don't know about you, but I can think some pretty weird stuff. God can do far more abundantly beyond what I think he can. According to the power, look at this, that works where? Within us. To him be the glory in the church in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. What I want to focus there on, where does the power of God work? Within me. 
In other words, I am the conduit, I am the channel of the grace and the power of God. And if I decide to sit back and just do nothing, and well, let's just see what God's going to do. He'll find somebody else to step into that position, but I'm going to miss the joy. I'm going to miss the fun of getting in there and enjoying my brothers and sisters and the work and the, and the, and the victory and the accomplishment. Accomplishment is great. You look at that accomplishment and you look back and think, God did this through us. But he did it. That's great. That's great. Enlarge your heart, Paul wrote. What do our actions, attitudes, words say about Christ? And as we come to a time of decision and invitation, is there, on a personal level, maybe somebody to whom you need to return and say, look, maybe we've had hard times, maybe we've had some tough times, maybe we've been out of focus with stuff. I want, I want us both to enlarge our hearts and let one another back in. You know, apologize if you need to, ask forgiveness if you need to, but get right so that the body can function again like it's supposed to. Maybe we need to look to each other in a challenge and say, let's enlarge our hearts for ministry. Let's enlarge our hearts for outreach. Let's enlarge our hearts for what we can do to impact people around us for Christ. Let them in and begin to enjoy what the Lord can do through us even more than we have. Those are great things. Personally, invitation time, focus in. What about others in your life? What do your words, actions, attitudes say about Jesus to them? And could you, like Paul, list these three things and say, we never did this, but we want to do the positive to glorify God in this circumstance. We're going to offer an invitation. I'll ask for you to be standing, please. We're going to pray together in just a minute. Uh, but as we do, if you today need to make a decision for Christ, if you have never uh, accepted him as your personal Lord and Savior, this is the time to do that. We extend that invitation to you if you... Do not or have not uh, and don't know what that is. We can tell you what it is. We can make it so that you will understand. And it's a very simple process, a very easy thing in the Word of God. Jesus is not hiding from anybody, but he is saying, whosoever will may come. That's your need today. We invite you to come forward. You need to place membership with the church. Now, you always say, well, that sounds crude. Now, you've gone from talking about spiritual things to put membership with the church. So... What that really means to us is you're going to identify with the body and say, hey, I want to be the pinky finger, or I want to be the big toe, or I'd like to be a leg. I want to be active and a part of what's happening. That's all joining this congregation is. It's not a, it's not a magic thing. It's not a secret thing. We won't give you a secret code ring, a secret handshake. You can be part of it. It's just based on your relationship with Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's all we care about. Then you're an active part of the body. So the invitation is extended. If you need to accept Christ as your Savior, if you need to identify with the body, that's what this time is for. Let's stand together and pray. Heavenly Father, you have been so good to us, and it is so wonderful to see what you accomplished, not to our glory, but like the song says, to your glory, all things, when your people are willing to become channels of your power and grace. You truly can do far beyond all that we might ask or think through your power at work in us. And so my prayer today as we come to this decision time, number one, Lord, if there's anyone here who does not know your son but needs to desperately today, needs to be free from the penalty of sin, needs to know they are bought and redeemed by the blood, I pray that you will touch that person's heart through the word which has been spoken. Your word is the power. I pray that the word will touch someone's life and move them today. Father, if there's someone today that needs to, to identify with your body, pray that that will happen. Whatever our needs may be, Lord, may we bring them to you and joyfully, joyfully expect a wonderful answer way past what we could ever think of ourselves. We love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together as we sing. Again, this is a great song to make as a prayer for yourself. Look at these words, sing them to the Lord, and make them your prayer. Respond if you need to today. Right forward here. Take a seat on this one. Amen. 
stuff starts to happen and both of these young ladies, note that I said young ladies, <laughs> so I point that out, came forward today to praise God for great stuff that has happened. No, Christina does not have a job yet, but I feel like God's probably working on that, but she has been blessed and needs have been met and she wanted to come forward specifically to offer praise and let you know that today. This other young lady, <laughs> Jeannie, <laughs> has come forward to offer praise for the ministry of the body to their family and the impact that it has had in their life. Plus, the fact that if you followed this story through the week, Selena came through a very hairy deal with that whole emergency surgery and everything. The baby's doing great. Selena's doing great. So we have wonderful, wonderful things to report from that. And praise and credit for all of it, everything goes straight to God. I'm going to ask you to pray with me right now. Heavenly Father, we often bring our needs to you. In fact, that's, you know, we do that a lot, Lord. We just are people who do that. And you've asked us, instructed us, commanded us to do that. So we do that. But sometimes, Lord, we want to admit that we are slower to bring the praises and the answered prayers back and report on them. And so today, Lord, we exult in the glory that you have wrought in the lives of people. You have met needs. You have preserved life. You have kept families together. You have done so much that were we to actually probably sit here and tick off the list, we'd be here all day. You have blessed everyone in this building in some way. And Father, forgive us for the times when our worldly-centered eyes are closed and we don't see that. We sure see the needs, but we don't see the responses. So, Father, again, we do pray for needs today. We pray for the needs of this group and you know what they are but father we exult and rejoice in the answer to prayer and the praises that flow because of jesus and what you have done you are wonderful we bless your name we ask that you receive our praise in his name amen now another thing to praise god for is what jesus did on the cross for us two thousand years ago 
commemorated in the Lord's Supper, the cup representing his blood, the bread, his body. Simply an opportunity to remember, that's what he established it for, graphic and real, simple. But it's our chance to examine ourselves, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, and to remember the sacrifice he made. Let's sing together about how mighty he is to save us, and then Kenneth will lead us in a meditation, and, we, and during that time you prepare your heart to receive the Lord's Supper. meditation that he was a big soccer fan and he talked about how anxious he would get when watching his favorite team play. Now this was mainly because just one goal or one mistake can change the entire outcome of a close game. Now we real football fans know the feeling. Whether we root for Alabama or Auburn there are many, we know there are many tense moments when we're watching our team play. And this is because we also know that there are many different things that can happen during a game to determine whether our team wins or loses. 
Crowder wrote that he recently watched a tape delayed game of one of his uh, of, of his favorite team, and he wasn't near as anxious and tense because he already knew the outcome before he started watching. Now I understand that because when I watched the replay of this year's Alabama Georgia game, believe me, I was a lot calmer for the replay than I was for the original game. And uh, I would suspect that Auburn fans, such as Ben, were probably a whole lot calmer when they saw a replay of the uh, Auburn-Oregon championship game than the first time they watched it. But Crowder then pointed out that in life, it's sometimes like watching a live sporting event. If in life we are uncertain of the outcome, Therefore, we become anxious and we become tense because we are pretty sure that there will be shocks and surprises, frustrations and fears that will be encountered along life's way. Christians, however, should take a look at this differently. Although many of life's situations are uncertain, we can rest in the peace and comfort that our eternal outcome has already been settled through Christ's work on the cross. In uh, 1 John 5, 13, the apostle wrote, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Now, just because we know our eternal outcome, that doesn't mean we're not going to have problems, frustrations, and all the aforementioned concerns. But it does mean that if we will hold true to our faith in Jesus in the end, we win. Now, pretty much everybody would agree that Cam Newton was the star of Auburn's championship team. And many would agree that A.J. McCarron was the star of Alabama's team this year. Even so, both of those boys made mistakes throughout the season that could have greatly affected the season's outcome. Well, if you think about it, Christ is the real star of history and our eternal outcome is certain because he never made a mistake. He never faltered. He never sinned. And one more thing in this analogy. Although A.J. and Cam were the big stars, everybody on their teams got a championship ring. The guys that made mistakes throughout the year still got a championship ring because they were part of the team. Even the guys who showed up to practice every day and never got on the field for a single play got a ring because they were part of the team. Now, as we gather around the Lord's table here, just let us remember that when Jesus lived a perfect and sinless life and then shed his blood on the cross, he settled our eternal outcome. And if we'll but believe in him and his finished work on the cross, then we are also on the winning team. But instead of a championship ring, as James put it, we get an eternal crown of life. Pray with me, please. Lord, as we gather around your table, we just give you all the glory and honor. And we thank you for the privilege, Lord, of remembering you and your sacrifice. And Lord, we know that there are many things in life that are uncertain. But Lord, we can rest in the assurance that in the end, Lord, if we'll believe in you, and we'll remember your sacrifice, Lord, that our outcome is already settled and that we will be with you. Forgive us, Lord, for we come short of your glory, but thank you for your sacrifice. In your holy name we pray. Amen.
We have we have a problem. We have no offering plates. Wow. <laughs> I think they're going to get them. Here they come. Here they come. <laughs> We're not going to let you get out of here without an offering going around. Come on. <laughs> Let's run through the announcements just briefly of what's going to happen this week. Uh, just a, a reminder, 5 o'clock today, uh, we'll be having the McKimmy Bible Study here at 5. This is a very powerful lesson tonight. Um, it's uh, So the World May Know. Uh, it's, it's an incredible series. starts with a video, and there, it, it's very powerful tonight. There's a, especially a section talking about uh, the Lord's Supper that I, I, I just found uh, touched me as I washed it and prepared. So invite you out for that 5 o'clock tonight. Then on Tuesday at 4 o'clock, elders will be meeting. If there's something that uh, you would like to, for the men to discuss or to meet with us, Jay, John, and myself, uh, let us know about it. Wednesday, 5.30 meal, uh, and then Bible study at 6.30. So if you've not turned in a reservation, let Tanya generally know you're going to be here for sure. Thursday, ladies will be meeting here at the church building at 12 noon for their Bible study. Just a reminder, on the 24th, so you can start getting your uh, tap dance ready, Charlie. Charlie's going to be tap dancing. But anyway, it's our talent night. Uh, so start working on whatever it might be. And, and when we say talent night, it doesn't have to be singing or playing an instrument. Uh, it could be doing a skit. could be doing a reading, whatever the case might be. So don't forget that. Uh, and I believe Andrea is the one that's sort of coordinating that. If you'll work with her, let her know. Don't forget we're on Facebook, of course. You can check us there. We're also online, and we're streaming. We're on the World Wide Web this morning. Hello to everybody. Now, how many have watched us the first couple of weeks? Do you remember the numbers? 482. I'm serious. I mean, it's hard to believe because it keeps track of people who come into uh, the live stream or download the video, watch it. Uh, this is a number that's kept on the website, uh, and it's like just shy of 500. We're trying to figure out how to pass a virtual offering plate, though. So, <laughs> you know, so I, I don't. Yeah, it was a virtual offering, I guess, for a while. But, uh, but anyway, uh, this, this streaming has, I mean, people are watching. We have people in other countries that watch and report back to us. We had people watching the concert last Saturday night. So uh, this has turned out to be an incredible tool that people are checking out Cornerstone Christian Church. But uh, if they all show up here one Sunday, we're going to be in trouble. So, <laughs> And it is a great problem. We'll do something, won't we? Uh, just, uh, you know, again, going back to uh, we, we sort of wrapped up this fundraising, uh, this portion of it. Of course, you can still give. They still need some money. We started out, and, and um, I, I think that uh, the, uh, Holmes had said, well, if we get five bucks, I'll be happy. Last Sunday, we thought it was 5200 Then we found it was more like closer to... Um, Six thousand. Now it's top seven thousand dollars, and and one of the things, you know, from the, from what started out just sort of as as a seed, let's try to do something, and it blossomed from there. But you know, Jay made a statement. He you know talked about God's power in us, and and how we are the conduit. We're not the power, and I I don't see how we even dreamed it was possible that $7,000 could be raised in this small group. But it's God's power. We were just simply the conduit. Everybody who worked, and the great thing about it, what it did for relationships and bringing people closer together, that's what being a part of the body was about. I, I'm like Jay. I saw people laughing and sharing. And, and if you know, get involved. Be a part of ministry because you'll be amazed at how much fun it really is. And so... Uh, Anyway, it's good having you with us this morning. If you're, yes, do I see something? Larry. What? I'd, I, we do need to recognize one of our direct support missionaries is here today. Tim Tadlock is with, throw your hand up, Tim. No, your other hand. There, there you go. Um, Tim is uh, second guy, second banana. <laughs> well, I don't know what your title is. With Neighbors in Christ, local organization ministers to victims of crime there is no organization like neighbors in christ anywhere and certainly not in this area you need to meet with tim talk to him about neighbors uh if you are looking for something to volunteer for bamo there you go right there his new bride is with us madam your sympathy card is in the mail <laughs> right so and right I, there, and I, tim tim and i will say um 
back several months ago, our office was broken into and several things stolen from it. And I never, and they came up. And uh, we, they happened to be one of my neighbors there in the office complex. But Tim came up, he secured our doors for us, he put on new deadbolts, gave us these kick things that you could put under the doorknob. In fact, somebody tried to get into some of the other offices the other night. Did you know that? Yeah, they couldn't get in mine because Tim had been up there. So anyway, um, we, we found out firsthand what they do, and they came up and they did that for us. It sure made me feel a lot better. One other thing I need to mention, uh, and I see your hand. <laughs> uh, next, uh, let's see, coming up on the uh, 12th of February, the Cornerstone Ladies Valentine Social Daphne O'Hare, who's a family advocate at Maxwell, is going to be the speaker. Ladies, we want a full house. 6 o'clock on Tuesday the 12th, uh, back here in the fellowship classroom. Uh, there'll be prizes and all sorts of things and chocolate. So you should be here, so don't forget that. I see hands everywhere. Okay, uh, first of all, yes, Lillian. And we help, we raise some of their, the support going to them this year in this mission year because they are. They're, they're a great organization. They're lean. Now, they're not mean, but they are lean. And, uh, and we, really, we really, Jay is on the board. I serve on the advisory board. But these are great folks. And your hand, madam. Okay. Okay, we should have mentioned that. Next Sunday, February 10th, Cornerstone Kids Club. What they? Lunch. Games, crafts, lots of fun. Okay. If they're age three or four, stay with them. Other, otherwise, you can leave them here. And yes. You're selling what now? Valentine. Okay. It, Valentine basket C. It's her sorority. Um, check with Fred. Christina. I just can't get them out of my mind sometimes. They get up here and, you know, it's, it's a problem. Anything. Anything else. <laughs> Otherwise, all right, please stand. And we'll let you go to lunch. Uh, have you enjoyed it today? It's been great. Let's give the Lord an applause offering because I got to tell you, I was touched by the music and the message, and it's just been great being here with all of you, and we look forward to it again. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you. Um, uh, it's just an, an honor to come before you, uh, Father, to know that what you have done for us through Jesus Christ uh, and, and to lift praises to you of thanks, Father, to, to just be able to share in ministries like Neighbors in Christ and others that reach out and touch people. Father, let us be conduits like Jay talked about. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Sing one more with us. Let's keep the cross before us as we go out and the world behind us. Before me, the world behind, no turning back. Raise the banner high, it's not for me, it's all for you. Let the heavens shake and slip the sky. Let the people clap their hands and cry, it's not for us, it's all for you. Do
The universe 